So the title is uh, Simple Cell Oblate Protomics Discovery and Application. So, as Julian said, uh, I'm representing a Copenhagen Center of Glycomics. That's just for you, it's our new home. We're going to move next year. Uh, well, currently, we're located in this building, but uh, very soon we'll be on this uh, floor. Uh, I'll give you uh, three short stories. So, um, brief intro about overcosylation, introduce you to the simple cell, and then uh, speak about a couple of uh, uh, applications. I was really happy that Chris gave uh, the introduction about glycomics. Uh, historically, people in glycoprotomics field uh, kind of uh, divided in three groups. So, um, some people do uh, pure glycomics, so they shave glycans from the peptide backbone. For example, in this case, for, like, for N glycans, they use PNGSF enzyme, where they can release them and then analyze those things to some clinical applications. Other people do uh, site mapping the same way. If you do PNGSF, you can uh, do a protomics approach and then uh, identify what was formerly N glycosylated. And uh, the dream, that's actually what um, probably people are always dreaming, to do uh, intact glycopeptase analysis. But this is an uh, extremely analytically challenging task. Uh, I can only comment that if you have pure isolated protein, then probably you can actually do this job quite successful. But if you have uh, some complex matrix, complex mixture, it's extremely difficult, not only from the uh, data interpretation, but also the detection of those molecules. If glycopeptides are sitting in the background of naked peptides, the peptides suppress them and you don't see the signal. So you basically you have to do some enrichment. And this is another analytical challenge for this field. Another class of uh, uh, glycans are all glycosylation, particularly all gel necktie glycosylation. The, 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 the challenge here that, uh, number one, as Chris also mentioned, there is no template for those molecules. Another uh, challenge is that the, this first initiation is controlled by 20 different Kelnet T enzymes. And uh, interesting uh, about them that they are differentially expressed in, your, in the human organs. For example, liver does not show T3 Galnet. Just an example. And this is actually the focus in our lab, this all Galnet glycosylation. That's what I mentioned. So uh, complexity, uh, no consensus motif, uh, poor prediction algorithm, no universal enzyme to release all glycans like PNGSF, and they are highly differential and um, dynamic, uh, those 20 Gelnet T enzymes. Uh, to persuade you to understand that that uh, knowing um, of uh, oblacosylation site is important. I would like to use this example where it's so clear. This is FGF23 um, uh, therapeutic molecule where uh, glycosylation, oblacosylation serves as a protective mechanism. So if there is no glycosylation, furin kills the protein and it's not released. But if you induce the glycosylation here, and this is Gelnec T3 specific, then you su suddenly start to secrete your protein in the media. A couple of more examples where knowing of those sites are important. Just brief overview. So ligand binding, receptor dimerization, ectodomain shadings, PC processing I mentioned before, and so on. That's actually a background for our uh, focus, and that's actually uh, what we focusing on our web. How to handle this uh, analytical task? So this is the overview of all potential complexity. Clear, it's uh, extremely, it's impossible or extremely challenging to uh, analyze them uh, uh, when they're together. So we decided to kind of simplify the problem and moving from uh, we call next generation or true glycoprotonics to something so-called simple cell. In this case, we move the challenge to the protonics field where there are a lot of methods already established and developed. How do we do this? This actually help us um, <coughs> to come to our goal, the first initial goal, to, do, uh, to maximize protein identification and maximize site uh, 
a mapping. So we're using those DNA scissors. So uh, initially we started with thin finger, and uh, now we move to the CRISPR. So how do we do those? How do we apply those DNA scissors? So in order to elongate, I mentioned, remember that uh, the first, the nature put this galnet T on the peptide backbone. And then the nature elongate further and further. To be able to uh, uh, work for this enzyme, you need this straight brown cosmic. So if you knock it, this uh, uh, enzyme will not work. And instead of this elongation, you would get this short TN epitope. So instead of all this complexity, suddenly you have those simplified glycosylations. So we call them simple cell uh, uh, technique. Okay, this was the background. Now we can start. Here on this uh, slide, I would like to summarize the strategy of our workflow. As I mentioned again, so to be able to identify those glycopeptides, you need to do glycopeptide enrichment. So we do a simple cell, we do a classical proteomics approach, we do digest, and then we apply a mixture on the lectin chromatography. So we're operating um, of the lectin column of um, around three meters, sometimes five meters, sometimes 10 meters, depends on the application. So currently, uh, we're using those three uh, lectins. They are, each of them are uh, glycoepitope specific. For example, if you want to trap a galnet T epitope dose, you usually apply VVA lectin. If you want to trap OMAN, uh, we do the same simplification in oman isolation machinery. You do a CONA, the specific oman isolation. And the nice, we use also PNA to trap uh, this galnet gal epitope, so-called T epitope. This is not uh, for simple cell, but this is for real samples. For example, um, most of the um, uh, old lichens in the real, in the, in the, in the human, I would say 80% roughly, are uh, sialo T epitope or disialo epitope. So if you remove shave salic acid, you end up with this epitope and you can do successfully your real samples like plasma, tissue, uh, any biofluids. So at the end, we get those uh, enriched mixtures. Then we go for mass spectrometry. The um, uh, mixture are super complex, so you need an additional fractionation. We do either, either electric focusing or we do high pH fractionation, like similar way you have heard today from, uh, from Jesper or other guys in the first uh, session. And then we apply high pH, high, high pressure uh, chromatography and uh, orbit rate. So we do a um, uh, classical, uh, let's say, virtual top 10 method, where we basically select uh, in parallel top five precursors and do ETD. The same top five we do HCD. Uh, the reason of doing that is that um, <clears throat> they are sometimes complementary, sometimes um, uh, HCD failed in identif identification, sometimes ETD fails if there are too many proteins. So we still have to use both of them. And then data processing. For data processing, we are using Proton Discover platform. So that's a typical example. So if you look, uh, this is a total ion chromatogram. And this is an extracted ion chromatogram. If you monitor for this oxonium uh, ion 204, this is there. You can see that the mixture is super well enriched. Almost every single case is your glycopeptide. So previously we were doing some triggering, so sending, uh, telling the instrument, hey, if you see this uh, oxonium, do ETD. But these days we stop doing that because each single case is a glycopeptide. There is no sense to doing this triggering. This is an example where HCD alone fails. So you basically see only losses of hex epitope. This is um, a glycopeptides uh, of potentially five sites out of six. The same precursor with ETD, you can see uh, fantastic sequence coverage and you can identify those glycosides. Another cool example, uh, what we actually we were able to discover with our simple cell approach, this is a distroglycan of um, uh, 10 potential glycosides. And I should say that this is 
just due to the limitation of uh, proton discovery and sequest uh, algorithm, which at that time was limited to 10 PTM um, simultaneously. So we actually know that there are cases where we have sugars uh, 12, 15, and 20 uh, glycosides uh, at the same time. Uh, that's an uh, overlap I mentioned before, why we are doing ETD and HCD. So pretty nice overlap. So from ETD we do uh, an ambiguous site identification, but uh, we still would like to use HCD because this uh, uh, fragmentation gives us at least some ideas that this is the sequence and this is uh, glycosylated and what is the degree of glycosylation. Monoglycosylated, polyglycosylated. Sometimes you have only one possibility and even using HCD you can uh, determine the site. And this is actually uh, how we... Okay, next slide. So then we decided to apply this technology and then um, <clears throat> map 12 different simple cells. As you can see, they are from different organs. And we, uh, at that time, uh, end up with um, uh, identification of uh, roughly 600 glycoproteins, organic glycoproteins, and uh, roughly 2,000 O glycosides. So uh, this is just uh, the overlap what was at that time in the Unipro database, and that's what we have discovered. You can see there was a big expansion at that time. So another interesting example we uh, kind of um, found and um, came to this discovery. So uh, it was um, uh, <clears throat> HCD spectrum. I should mention how we actually process. Uh, so to process this spectrum, we do some kind of um, we wrote our own script where we subtract sugars from the precursor mass and then do a, a sequest a, a search where basically uh, you can boost your score by a factor of two or three in that case. And we found that this is glycopeptide, nice sequence identification. There are two so there's axonium fragment ions, but where is serine trianine? No, no, there are nothing in this sequence. So we hypothesized, well, maybe it's something on the tyrosine. So we included this tyrosine search to the sequence, and then we found that suddenly ETD spectrum was up. So basically confirm that there is a no glycosylation on the tyrosine. So making this deeper and deeper, we uh, finally roughly more than 100 cases where the, we found the tyrosine glycosylation. So we also found uh, this tyrosine glycosylation not only in um, uh, simple cell, just to preventing your question, are there any kind of mismatch with the gluconac? Uh, uh, I would like to say no, because we found also in the uh, human plasma uh, samples uh, having this tyrosine glycosylation as uh, hex hexnac or T uh, epitope unit. Okay, so uh, using this um, uh, approach, we uh, decided to do a, a quantitative glycoproteomics. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, those 20 gelnac T enzymes were interesting. What is the biological role of those enzymes? And we do. Uh, we apply the, um, this approach where we do a sequential. So in the cosmic background, we do a, a sequential uh, a knockout of uh, one of those uh, Gelnet T. And using uh, two different uh, quantitative approaches. One is a dimethyl labeling, where you label a simple cell with light channel. You label a simple cell and Gelnet T with a medium. And you do a, a dimethyl labeling. So uh, mix samples together, and then you monitor those um, cases. So I should say that the most interesting case for us are so-called syngans, where the glycosylation is uh, completely removed from your, from your knockout sample. So this is actually the true link of the uh, Gelnet T specificity. And, um, <coughs> There are a lot of uh, uh, some uh, uh, analytical challenges of the uh, easy determination of those cases. So we, in parallel, we also doing TMT um, uh, approach. So in this case, we label um, in this case with um, one uh, channel and the other channel. In this case, we use uh, uh, two distinct channels from TMT TMT 10x to avoid the overlap. So uh, mix together. So now uh, your precursors are 
on top of each other, you boost kind of intensity, and then you monitor on your, uh, you do quantification on your uh, fragments, so uh, uh, MSMS fragment ions. So you do a um, um, quantification, and in this case, the singlet uh, uh, determination is more accurate because uh, we found that TMT in this case works um, better. And also, you do uh, uh, you double the number of uh, identified cases. So uh, this is the application. We apply this uh, differential glycoprotomics on the FG2 liver cell model, uh, where we did actually. Um, two sequential knockouts, so we did uh, GELNEC T1, GELNEC T2, and we also did GELNEC T3 insertion. Remember I mentioned that typically GELNEC uh, um, FG2 cell does not express uh, GELNEC T3. So this is some kind of uh, artificial way to find uh, T3 specific cases. And these are the um, uh, summary, so um, all those uh, singles, uh, resulted to this um, list of those proteins. 66 found to be T1 specific, I mean uh, 66 size. Uh, 72 to T2 and 121 to T3 specific. So basically uh, we can uh, answer this question if the Gionic T repertoire regulates the old microproteome. Uh, we've just found that uh, it's a kind of confirmation what we knew before that EPOS 3 protein is T2 specific, and by doing this approach, we found this case very nice, and there are a few more cases, so NGPT03 and others. So this is another example. So we are doing uh, uh, some uh, biopharma application, and um, uh, as you probably know, that uh, CHO cell are one of the model to produce your biopharmaceuticals. And of course, we would like to, to know more about this CHO. And we would like to actually discover also the specificity, you know, how can we control the glycosylation machinery in, in CHO cell. So we did the same simple cell and differential. So in this case, uh, uh, there are two examples where you have, uh, in one case, it's T2 uh, knockout. The other case is double knockout. So it's a T1 and T2. As you can see, if you knock out T2, uh, enzyme, you have uh, this little shield. So one pool of glycopeptides, there is no regulation, and there's a second Gaussian shifted to the left, which is uh, highlight those T2 specific cases. If you do a uh, double knockout, T1 and T2, then you see that almost everything has been shifted. So we basically confirm what is known from the uh, expression level uh, measured for those enzymes that these are the two of the most abundant uh, enzymes in CHO cell. And they do the, the job. So, um, okay, so um, uh, next application. So as I said, we, we try to expand our capacity and then try other different applications. So we decided to jump to the real samples, to biofluids. Uh, in this case, it's a plasma, a sera, or urine and also do some tissue studies, which is the brain, liver, kidney. In addition, we also routinely applying, uh, in addition to trypsin, we're applying glucine and chymotrypsin, and we find them really fantastic. In this case, just one comment. Uh, Jesper mentioned that uh, uh, today that the trypsin is fantastic, and it almost covers uh, everything, and glue and chymo uh, helps you a little bit in terms of protein identification, but mostly helps you uh, to expand your sequence coverage for the same protein. In our case, with the glycoproteomics, uh, even for glycoproteome identification, those are still uh, as good as trypsin. I mean, in a unique way. So that means if you take your trypsin, glue, there's something like that. So really uh, it significantly boost everything, uh, protein and glycosides, of course. As I said, uh, uh, those uh, epitopes are uh, the most abundant in all galnet glycosylation. So we just simply uh, shave uh, salic acid by using a neuromidase treatment, uh, usually either four hours or two plus two hours, and then uh, peptides and go for LVAC. In this case, we also found another uh, working, which is uh, 
to our mind it works better than DNA, so it's a Jacqueline. So we still use in parallel, but um, um, yeah, and then we, we apply. So here I would like to give you a snapshot, um, not too many details, but a snapshot of three uh, uh, real samples. So we did uh, urine, uh, plasma, and brain. So you can see uh, we have identified uh, from one single uh, <coughs> experiment uh, roughly 800 glycoproteins in urine, 370 glycoproteins in plasma, 530 uh, proteins in the uh, mouse brain. And these are the site numbers. So urine, 3,000 uh, old glycosides, unique and ambiguously assigned. So those are just from ETD only. 790 for plasma and uh, 1,500 for mouse brain. So we're still working on this data and um, working on the manuscript. Uh, finally, I would like to show you this like a historical overview of the activity in our laboratory. So that's how we started in 2011. And basically every year we expanded the, the knowledge by factor two or three. So currently we are at about of uh, 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 an ambiguously identified 5,000 glycoproteins and roughly 15,000 glycosides. So these data were tried to make publicly available to the community. So this is the, uh, the resource. You're welcome to have a look. So, uh, so uh, we have um, a couple of different topic tools. So these are uh, you can watch for size, you can, you can use a, a predictor, which we're working together with Soren Brunek, uh, trying to improve his uh, algorithm. And also uh, uh, we have a um, uh, bioinformatician from Australia here, who actually uh, doing a lot in this visualization tools. So he is doing this glycodomain domain viewer. Welcome to have a look, if you find your case there. So um, I would like to uh, end up with this slide, so to give you some uh, ideas what are we going to do uh, in the future in our lab. So as I said, a lot of activities uh, around this differential work like a protonic. So we are currently working on an animal model. So we have uh, um, a couple of uh, accounts in the red where we are uh, trying to uh, identify the, the different accounts. We have like T8, 9, 11. And we're trying to see how the, the difference in the different organs, brain, kidney. Also, we are expanding our activity in glycoprotomics uh, and biofluids, especially in terms of the application to the clinics. Uh, uh, this is very potential tool to our uh, direction. Uh, as you probably know, in a cancer case, uh, cancer expressed the increase of this uh, TN epitope in the, in the patient. So, <coughs> If you are if you're healthy, you are mainly lack of uh, TN uh, glycopeptides. But if you have a cancer case, then those TN epitope alone are highly expressed. So um, what I would like also to, to mention, this is extremely important to the field, to measure glycosylation stoichiometry inside occupancy. So as you see, almost one quarter of proteins found to be glycosylated. But what to be considered to be a glycoprotein? So just one example, when I was a student, we always had a joke, like uh, if you want to do something stupid, you know, fish glycosylation in, uh, in albumin. And now we found 17 of glycosides in the human albumin. So, uh, but we don't know the site occupancy. If this is less than 1%, so this is probably an important question to address. So to avoid some maybe artifacts or other things. And also our dream, uh, we're working to kind of combine our knowledge and techniques and then jump to the so-called next generation of glycoprotomics, where we can do in a high throughput way, in a complex sample matrix, we can do simultaneous identification of everything. Glycostructures, peptide sequence, which means protein, and do site mapping. Okay, and I would like you to thank you for your attention. So, and this is the group, uh, we're in about 30 people, a lot of international collaborations, some people are in this audience, and uh, head of our department, Henry Kowalson, I really uh, advise you to come to his plenary lecture tomorrow.
so you can see more uh, uh, functional glycoproteomics applications from his talk. And uh, yeah, our foundation, financial support, and thermal for the opportunity to speak. I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>